Now I want to start our conference off with a survivor story. Um, we are all here because we want to make a difference, right? Um, we want to save a life, um, and it's only appropriate to start off the conference with a short video of an amazing survival story. We had a Southern Gospel Quartet for 12 years. I've played in church since I was 14 years old. Made three CDs with the quartet, and I did a piano CD. On that Sunday, which was August 15th, driving over to the church, that's the last I remember that day. I noticed that Gary wasn't looking quite right. And I look, and he's holding onto a stand, and he was having trouble with that stand. And I thought, what's he doing with that? And then all of a sudden, he just slowly, like in slow motion, he fell down to the ground. I was in my office. I got a knock on my door from my friend Roy. He said, uh, Adam, we've had an event. I just immediately said, we need somebody who can provide some medical help for Gary right now. And as I was saying the words, there were two ladies who were walking forward already. I am a second year emergency medicine resident at the University of Cincinnati. So we were sitting pretty close to the back of the church because we had gotten there late. I got up and ran up there and checked for a pulse and I didn't feel anything. I asked my youngest sister, Victoria, to come up. I did a quick seminar with her, like this is where you put your hands, this is how fast I want you to do it. I don't think people knew in the church where the AED was because it took a long time for the AED to arrive. It was a weekend day, so staff was not on duty. So I was at home, did respond from home, listened to radio traffic and route, and it was clear that we had a cardiac arrest. And CPR was in place by unknown citizens. This station was the first arriving unit on scene. We fortunately were not on another call at that time. Someone asked me, I, I couldn't believe how calm you were, and I, I said, but it, it was that feeling of knowing that he was being taken care of. I had seen him get shocked, I believe, three times to try to bring him back. They tried one more time, and they got a pulse. I'm running and calling my sister on the phone. I just said, Dad's in um, cardiac arrest, they're doing CPR, and they're taking him down to Branson. I think we had estimated it was about 15 minutes of them doing chest compressions and, and working with the AED before they were able to bring him back. You know, Roy thought that his friend had just died. But I was able to, to tell him that they had a pulse again, and I'll never forget the look on his face. I drove to the ED, I got down there, but I remember thinking, he's not gone. I don't feel like he's gone. The first initial part where I knew my dad was going to be okay was when he actually um, squeezed my mom's hand and squeezed my hand. That was an immediate relief for me knowing, okay, his brain's intact. He's going to be okay. We have always been a pretty tight-knit family, right? And honestly, for my dad, the most selfless person you'll ever meet. He never came first. He's one of my best friends. There were only 35 people in the congregation. What are the odds, if you want to go there, that there would be a doctor and a nurse in an EMT? I think it was kind of divine intervention that we were at church that day. I tell him I love him a lot more. He knows, but the words come out a lot more because he's, he's an awesome man. I can't thank them enough, all of them. Life Ambulance, Bronson Hospital, Ashtimo Fire Department. He truly is a miracle. He's still back in his you know, workshop, he's outside, he is um, doing everything that he was doing beforehand, um, but honestly now he's even better. I want to be able to emphasize the importance of the chain of survival for cardiac arrest patients. And that first step is, in fact, recognition, and we were fortunate to have that. Uh, Gary was in a public place, so people were around him. I think about the moment a lot. 
it's a, a memory Roy and I, I think, will always share of witnessing somebody return from death. I strongly encourage folks, churches specifically, please get an AED in your building. You have a lot of people come in there, and they're all cherished people. So let's let's have the ability to save their lives when the right time comes. What a, what a touching video. Um, I'm going to turn this down a little bit so I don't yell at you. Um, and so we need more stories like Gary, right? We need more stories like that. And now I'd like to introduce one of our core Save My Heart members, uh, Dr. Tony Sue, to talk more about those events and those involved. Tony. Thank you very much, Dr. Pribble. Uh, welcome, everyone. Survivors experience the finite of life with an encounter with their own mortality. Attitudes about life may refocus on personal relationships and long-term support from counselors and loved ones help survivors accept and adapt to the changes in their perspectives. The feelings between family and survivors are mutual. S seeing their loved ones reborn and live fully can really help with their own adjustments. In-person and online social supports for both survivor and families may be helpful. So we saw this video, uh, quite touching, quite well put together. Um, there was definitely some drone shots. Uh, drone AEDs are coming our way, I'm sure. Um, let me skip this video. It was just a duplicate. Um, I'm not going to go into the hands-only CPR portion of this, um, but I just want to let everybody know that, you know, lay rescuers are an unrecognized and untapped resource for improving community engagement. Many wonder, the lay public especially, if what they did was adequate, as they haven't had the chance, like many paramedics and hospital personnel, to be involved in codes. We should help remove that guilt by chipping in however we as professionals can. Consider low-pressure CPR training for families. This can reduce fear and anxiety. And community settings are actually the best place to do so. Um, local firefighter departments and online groups can also be a resource as well. When I think of what it takes it to, to succeed in a cardiac arrest uh, survivor, um, it takes multiple links of the chain, but really it's community. Uh, not only during the event, but also afterwards, the survivor can then pay it forward. This is a message that has given me purpose, and I'm hoping for the survivors in this room gives them purpose as well, to see a new day. So I'd like to have Gary Vandenberg please uh, come sit in one of these beautiful high chairs. So, so Gary, um, I'm using, can you guys hear me with this? I'm using um, Gary as a genetic sample. And so when you start with a genetic sample, you start at the center. We have Esther. Can we have Esther join us? Right by Gary's side. Perfect. So she's, she's uh, the instigator for uh, the keyboard group, as you saw, that Gary was um, helping set up. And just before uh, he grabbed onto the music stand, he was putting all the keyboard and speakers, and these are not light things. He was exerting himself. And so I'd like the rest of the family who are here to come up and stand behind them as well.
So we have Christy, Paul, Carrie, Diane. And so on this day, um, Dr. Tillotson, the resident we saw um, in the video, and her sister, Victoria, were the first to lay hands on the patient. Can we have the first responders come up? We have Captain Michael Parker, Firefighter Cody. He told me his last name and I cannot pronounce it again. Chief Mark Barnes, Lieutenant Joe Keck, Firefighter Eric Olson, Firefighter Sam Vermeulen, Firefighter Drake Wednig, and Deputy Chief McComb. Several of them are working today, uh, keeping us safe here in Kalamazoo. So I want to thank them as well. And at this time, Gary didn't recognize any of these first responders or uh, firefighters that came in. And of course, now they're very good friends. Um, because he had passed away for 15 minutes. Uh, can we have paramedics Logan Connell and Nicole Evans join us as well on the sides? All right, so we're going to start off with the paramedics. So this is the group. Uh, that made this story and survival happen um, with the science and with the data that is being collected. We will have many more of these stories, I hope. So I'd like to recognize paramedic Nicole Evans on responding to a cardiac arrest on August 15th, 2021, and doing her best. Thank you very much. I'd like to recognize paramedic Logan Connell. Here we go. I'd like to recognize Captain Michael Parker. I'd like to recognize Lieutenant Joe Keck. <laughs> Cody, please help me with your last name. It's just Skydevor. Skydevor, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to recognize Chief Mark Barnes, <laughs> who came in from home. Here we go, sir. I'd like to recognize the survivor, Gary Vandenberg. What you're going to be doing for the rest of your life is showing everybody how to heal because you have healed yourself. And uh, it's a nice way to lead the rest of your life, I think. Thank you very much. Now I'm gonna give you two coins. These are survivor challenge coins. Um, I give each survivor who has saved my heart two of them. One for you to give who you think contributed the most, beyond of course everybody else here, to your uh, well-being and your recovery. I have a few more comments, sorry about this. So before we end this kickoff portion of our Save My Heart conference, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that Oshmo Township Fire Chief Mark Barnes will be retiring as of today. He has served as... <laughs> he has served as chief for the past 14 years and has served for just 48 years in the fire service. Uh, chief Barnes was one of the first paramedics in Kalamazoo County and contributed to the development of Kalamazoo's 
uh, early defibrillation program. It was one of the first in the state to allow medical first responders to use AEDs. Chief Barnes has been a constant champion of EMS and of improving outcomes from sudden cardiac arrest. Please join me in thanking Chief Barnes for his amazing service and wish him the absolute best in his well-earned retirement. Thank you all very much.